Erin Ryder, who simply goes by Ryder, is best known for her role on Sci-Fi Channel's Destination Truth, and most recently on Nat Geo's Chasing UFOs. In addition to being one of the stars of Chasing UFOs, Ryder is also a co-executive producer. We talk with Ryder about the show and about her views related to UFOs. Jace and I will also discuss habitable planets, strange lights in South Carolina, and other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. Greetings, friends, and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Marina Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us. Our guest on today's show is Erin Ryder from the show Chasing UFOs. We'll talk to her in just a little bit. But first, let's talk about UFOs in the news. Gary McKinnon has been in a legal battle for more than a decade and has been fighting extradition to the United States since 2006. The 46-year-old Scotsman admits to hacking into 97 U.S. military and NASA computers in 2001 and 2002 in search of UFO evidence. Experts have concluded that it is likely McKinnon, who suffers from Asperger's syndrome, will commit suicide if extradited to the U.S. But as the Wayland Hatfield Times recently reported at McKinnon's court appearance on July 5th, ministers, including Home Secretary Theresa May, want a new medical report before a ruling is made. May cited a personal concern that McKinnon had not been examined by a Home Office-appointed medical assessor. London's High Court gave McKinnon two weeks to decide if he would take the medical test to determine if he was fit to be extradited. But McKinnon reportedly refused the medical test. His mother, Janice Sharp, told BBC Three Counties Radio, it is not a refusal. He had no choice. It is an impossibility because the assessment they want him to have is by someone who has no experience and wouldn't be able to diagnose his suicide risk. Three leading Asperger's experts already concluded that McKinnon was at extreme risk of suicide if extradited, and that he is unfit for trial. Sharp told the BBC, I'm sure that Theresa May will do what's right and make a just and compassionate decision now and allow Gary to begin to regain some of the life he has lost. However, the case returned to London's High Court on Tuesday, July 24th, where May announced she will make her ruling in October. The Metro reports that this delay on her decision is due to, quote, the Home Secretary's important role in the London 2012 Olympics. This is, you know, unfortunate where she's putting off this guy. I mean, this guy's life's been affected for more than a decade, and his mom is devastated by this, and she's been pleading uh, for her made him just make the decision already, and she's called this, you know, kind of an immoral decision to choose a role with the Olympics over just making a decision now and letting Gary get on with his life. Right. I mean, this poor guy's been, just been dragged under the wire over and over again for the last 10 years. And I mean, it's one of those cases where I, it's, I'm almost sick of hearing it because right. it's like, get this guy's sentence done. Just keeps dragging on and on and yeah. on. And it's always the littlest things that keep it going. It's just been ridiculous. Right. And it's pointing out a lot of issues with the extradition. You know, and, rules. and we talked to Ryan Sprague a couple weeks ago on the show about not only Gary McKinnon's hacker case, but also uh, another one that happened prior to McKinnon that was dropped. And the fact that the, the other guy's case got dropped and McKinnon's has been dragging on for 10 years and there's this huge free Gary McKinnon campaign right. that people are like, just let the poor guy go. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, Maybe what he did was for the better because they're increasing security on their computer systems, which should be, you know, upgraded anyways. Well, we thought we were nearing the end of this Gary McKinnon saga, but it looks like it's continuing to go on and on and on. But we will definitely keep you posted with any updates. Multiple residents along South Carolina's Grand Strand recently observed UFOs in the sky. WPDE News Channel 15 recently aired a story about a July 18th sighting by Long South Carolina resident Joe Kierman. He told News Channel 15 that he observed strange flashing lights in the night sky for more than three hours. He explained that these UFOs did climbs, they went to altitudes, they changed directions that are beyond physics. It's just not possible. After the story aired, other witnesses contacted News Channel 15. The station interviewed witness Bill Barrett after he posted on News Channel 15's Facebook page. He explained that the lights he saw made no sense to him. He stated, if there's something out there or it's a military type situation, who knows? But it makes you scratch your head, that's for sure. MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, the reports indicate that several others saw the same strange lights. According to one witness report, these lights, quote, 
were coming from many directions and in many formations. The flashing lights reportedly occurred in many different sequences of flashes. Orange spheres and white twinkling lights were both described by witnesses. News Channel 15 reports that the Federal Aviation Administration said none of its pilots reported anything strange in the air that night. And nearby Shaw Air Force Base was not conducting training missions along the coast that night. Witnesses and officials have no idea what the lights were, but some witnesses say that the July 18th sighting was not the first time they've observed these lights in the sky, and some have even seen the lights since. There's a lot of activity in this area. You, you know, UFOs are commonly reported um, more heavily over water, over the ocean in particular, um, but this area of South Carolina has seen a lot of recent activity. Right, and we had a former pilot, or actually maybe he's a current pilot, report lights to us that weren't able to be explained and I don't think we've ever had a concrete explanation for within the last, I think it was probably six months ago. Yeah, and it sounds right. very similar to this case. It does, and these people who reported these lights, even after News Channel 15 reported the story, they continued seeing the lights in the sky, so it's interesting. Yeah. So, they got to get more recording done. If yeah, continuing more, more, to see more them. videos, more photos, more good quality, please. But hopefully, there's more <laughs> investigation going on. Hopefully, we'll find out more about these mysterious lights. An ex fighter pilot approached investigative journalist Antonio Huneas of Open Minds Magazine at the 2012 International UFO Congress and asked to share his story. This pilot, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dick French, informed Huneas that he spent some of his military career in the Air Intelligence Security Squadron, where he was tasked with investigating reported UFO sightings. But he claims that his superiors told him to debunk these sightings however he could. Although there really is no way to confirm claims made by former military personnel like this who choose to speak out about things like this, French's story is interesting. And you can go to our website, openminds.tv, to watch his video interview where he talks about this. And we see a lot more of this with these, you know, it typically happens with older military personnel um, who finally feel that, you know, they might be close to death, where they feel that there's, there's no reason for them to keep their secret anymore, so they start telling. We, we hear that a lot about this with um, particular Roswell inter right. uh, witnesses, um, and researcher uh, Don Schmidt talks a lot about this, what he calls the, the deathbed testimonies, mm -hmm. where people who apparently were active in the military at, at that time, come forward, um, well, they don't come forward, but they uh, tell their story on their literal deathbeds because there's no reason for them to keep the secret anymore. Well, and then we had um, Colonel John Alexander who was trying to get uh, it in place that, you know, there would be sort of sanctuary for these people, military officials and and everyone to come forward and tell their UFO stories. Right, that Am kind of amnesty for off these the witnesses, amnesty, but, you, but yeah, that, that sort of went nowhere. It caught the media's attention for a little bit, but I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything more about that. And I think that's a long shot. I don't think right. there's any, why would the military offer these people amnesty for spilling military secrets? But, but again, like you say, I mean, there's no really, we can confirm his ranking and, and those type of things, but and the fact that he actually worked where he said he did, things right. like that. But we can't really confirm his exact story. But however, it is an interesting story, and and I suggest everyone check out the video. Absolutely. And one more thing in this particular situation, you know, a lot of times we, not a lot of times, but in, in some of these cases where you hear people coming forward and revealing these big secrets or, or something, there's usually something else going on in the background, like a book they're trying a to book. pitch there's or something like that. But, uh, you know, in the case of these people who have nothing to gain, they're just telling a story of what they allegedly worked right. on during their time. It's interesting. So definitely go to openmize.tv and watch the interview for yourself. In space news this week, researchers at the University of Puerto Rico and Arecibo's Planetary Habitability Laboratory, the PHL, recently published a list ranking the top five potentially habitable alien worlds. These five Earth-like planets are Gliese 667, capital C, little c, Kepler-22b, HD 85512, Gliese 581d, and the good old Gliese 581g. Gliese 581g tops the list as the best candidate so far of a potentially habitable exoplanet, but some scientists aren't completely convinced that Gliese 581g even exists. Mike Wall of Space.com explains the discovery of Gliese 581g made headlines around the world in September of 2010 because the planet was said to orbit in the middle of its star's habitable zone. 
That just right range of distances where liquid water and perhaps life as we know it could exist. Just a few weeks later, however, another prominent research team began casting doubt on the find, saying the alien planet didn't show up in their observations. These scientists from the HARPS team from the Geneva Observatory were not able to detect Gliese 581G using their own data. And the PHL points out that, quote, further analysis by other scientists also questioned the existence of Gliese 581G in the last two years. But new research by the original discoverers of Gliese 581G, led by Stephen S. Vogt of UC Santa Cruz, provides an extended data set, further supporting the planet's existence. Space.com reports that according to Vogt, his team could only reproduce the Swiss researchers' results by tossing out a handful of data points. Despite the conflicting studies and challenges to the team's research, Vogt feels confident that his team's new data proves the existence of Gliese 581G. And based on this data, the PHL believes this planet is the best candidate for hosting extraterrestrial life. The team's new research is published in the journal Astronomical Notes. We've heard so much about Gliese 581G in the past, and again, with pretty much everything we talk about that involves scientists, we kind of go back and forth with people saying, here it is, no it isn't, here it is, no it isn't. So kind of back and forth. But I think we're back to where we were in 2010 when Gliese 581G we was think it exists. discovered <laughs> that, you know, it's a great place to look for extraterrestrial right. life. And we've already established that, I mean, like you said, in 2010, if it exists, it's probably, you know, the most mimicky of sort of conditions that we have here and we would most likely find extraterrestrial life. But again, with the scientists going back and forth, we're kind of back to square one, you said. So I mean, the Gliese planets are awesome. 581G yeah. is really awesome. And if we can ever get there someday, that's really awesome. But how about let's focus on Mars for now? We're a stalemate. Yeah, let's go to Mars. After the recent release of UK Ministry of Defense UFO files, Space.com published an article mentioning some details contained in these files. Although we discussed some highlights from these MOD files on last week's show, we're mentioning Space.com's article because the site published a poll along with their article. This was yet another poll asking people's belief in extraterrestrial life. The poll consisted of three possible answers to the question, do you believe alien life exists elsewhere in the universe? The possible responses were, yes, we may not have found it yet, but they're out there. No, aliens are part of science fiction, or I'm not sure. At the time of this filming, more than 8,000 people responded to the poll, with more than 90% of the respondents selecting, yes, we may not have found them yet, but they are out there. So many polls, again, polls, 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 and you know, who knows what their polling pool, where it's coming from, right. or, but I don't kind know. Of sick I, of I, polls. I'm not surprised that 90% and people shouldn't be, and in fact, you should be more surprised that it's not higher than that. Right. Because I mean, then this one is centering more on extraterrestrial life as can, compared to some of those other polls which are asking about actual UFOs, where we've both discussed how annoying it is that, yes, UFOs do exist. Do you believe exist. in we UFOs? Yeah. yeah. They do. We don't know if they're extraterrestrial, not all the time kind of thing. So, and a lot of the other polls talking about extra, extraterrestrial life, too, also include, I don't know, some of the questions are conflicting, as I mentioned before, but they also talk about alien life being here uh, and walking among us and things like that. Whereas this one, you know, being on space.com, they're very careful and they, they just pose it as, yes, it's out there, we haven't found it yet. Yeah. So they, they played it very safe, but still 90% extraterrestrials are out there. Theoretical physicist Michio Kaku appeared on CNN Newsroom on July 19th to discuss extraterrestrial life. He offered his opinion that if we encounter extraterrestrials, they're likely to be friendly. But if humans ever have to face hostile extraterrestrials in battle, he thinks, it would be like Bambi meeting Godzilla. He supports this claim by stating, if they're that advanced, they can reach Earth from a distant star, they are already thousands of years ahead of us technologically, and we would present no military challenge to such an advanced civilization. And although Kaku believes the more optimistic view that extraterrestrials are benevolent and will simply leave us alone, he cautions, we have to prepare for the possibility that they're not. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I. I I see what he's saying, but you know, he tried to be funny about this as well. But I, I do appreciate his viewpoint a little more than Stephen Hawking, who is just completely off the deep end, grim and Destru ultimate destruction of Earth. Totally kind of going to wipe us off but the face of the Earth and have no interest in being nice. I have to mention this because this was so cool. As soon as Jason and I started posting this news on Twitter, one of our Twitter followers 
sent us a link to this little cartoon that was literally Bambi being squashed by Godzilla. So Yeah, and I think it was actually <laughs> titled Bambi Meets Godzilla, yeah. the exact words of Michio Kaku. Which, who knows if <laughs> Kaku's seen that. He could that. have based it off of this cartoon. Maybe. I'd but never seen this cartoon But it's a cartoon of before. little Bambi being squished by Godzilla. So. Yeah, eh, it's cute. So it was kind of funny and very timely. But again, this is just a, you know, a supposition, and it's interesting. But again, it was on a major CNN show, and it's good to hear the topic being discussed, at least. Well, and especially by, like, I love Michio Kaku. Oh, yeah. Go Michio. Awesome. We love Michio. So it's always good to hear, like, these very esteemed physicists talking about extraterrestrial life. And very matter of fact. I mean, he, he absolutely believes in extraterrestrial mm -hmm. life, and he's not afraid to say it. So kudos, Michio. <laughs> Now let's talk with our guest today, Aaron Ryder. We are happy to be joined by Ryder on the show today. Ryder, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, I personally am extremely jealous. You just got back from San Diego Comic-Con. And, you know, it's been a, kind of a known thing in the field that there's a little bit of a difference between uh, the sci-fi geek community comparatively to the UFO community. So I'm curious as to sort of what was your reception and what difference have you seen between the community at uh, San Diego Comic-Con versus the UFO community's reception? You know, I think Comic-Con's a real uh, open open atmosphere. I think everyone there is really excited to be there, uh, ready to engage with, you know, all sorts of people from, from across different genres. So you go there and you're just completely accepted. It, it's... It was an incredible reception for us. Everyone um, that was there to see Chasing UFOs was incredible. Uh, had a lot of compelling stories, and you know we're really excited to meet all three of us. Um, lots of amazing costumes. I was actually jealous that I didn't dress up. Uh, but you know, within the UFO community, I think it's a little bit more critical. You know, these are people that have been doing the research in this field for a much longer, and I think that they, you know, kind of hold the show under a microscope. So perhaps, you know, they're you know, not as, you know, open to the different types of investigation methods that we use or, you know, exactly how the show is coming across all the time. You know, mm -hmm. we've, we've had a really great uh, audience so far, but but I think, you know, duly so, we, we deserve to be critically looked at and, and that's within the com community. I do think within the UFO community, it's kind of like, um, uh, like a gang, though, I think you've got, you know, you've got one side where, you know, they're, it's like, you know, they go with the Travis Waltons or the Stan Friedmans or whatever. And then the other side, they've got the Stan Romanax and, you know, some people believe in Bob Lazar and some people don't. So, you know, no matter what, if you believe in one way or another or you talk to one witness or another, there's going to be people that are highly critical of, of what you're doing and how you're doing it. Before I jump to the next question, I've got to ask, because I remember seeing this. You guys were posting this online when you were at Comic-Con, and I just had to ask, you were handing out ice cream at Comic-Con? How did that work? Was it astronaut ice cream? Uh, that's <laughs> freeze-dried ice cream, right? I, I wish it was astronaut ice cream. It was, you know, if you go down to Comic-Con, you realize how hot it is, and all we wanted was kind of, you know, to meet people and have some sort of relief for everyone to be out there. We were there during uh, the Zombie Freedom Walk, which was absolutely incredible. <laughs> zombie rights for everyone. Um, and so we had Frisbees, which made a little bit more sense. We had some, some saucers to give out. But then at the same time, we just wanted to have a reason for people to come over that hadn't seen the show to meet us and to kind of open a conversation about who we are and what we're doing. And I think that was a really great way to do that. No one else down there was doing it. Um, and we, we were able to bring in a lot of kids in. And I think that that's, we want to inspire young people to be asking these questions and to be doing this research for themselves. So um, it was a little trick to get people over. But then when, when they were there, it was really great to be able to share with them what we're doing and a little bit about National Geographic and, you know, who we are and, and what we're trying to bring into the mainstream. Awesome. In a recent interview with Maxim Magazine, you said something that I think resonates well with uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners. Um, you said, we just want people to know that it's okay to not only have these sightings, but also research and talk about it. I think that was a great statement. And, and is that something that you see the show, um, a, a role the show has? It's try trying to get people to take a serious look at UFOs and not to, you know, be hindered by this unfortunate existence of a ridicule factor that seems to be associated with it. 
Sure, sure. You know, I think whenever you have an opportunity to have a platform like we do uh, with National Geographic, which has been incredible, you know, we want to take advantage of it. And sure, there's going to be entertainment and sure, there's going to be, you know, different types of investigations that perhaps people don't always agree with. But at the same time, what we want to do is our best to kind of get rid of that stigma. It, it is OK for Ben McGee to come out and talk about, you know, potential sightings in the area. It's OK for, a, you know, a brilliant researcher like James Fox to openly, uh, you know, speak with different, um, you know, abductees about what happened to them because, you know, not everyone that loves UFOs and loves the mystery behind it is wearing, you know, aluminum foil hats and, you know, staying, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere, you know, in a trailer somewhere, you know, creeping around Area 51. These are legitimate researchers. And I, I think that that um, needs to continue. You know, it's been a long time since someone outside of the community has talked about this. And I think Ancient Aliens, they do an incredible job. I thought, you know, UFO Hunters, you know, did, did a really great job speaking out about it. And I think that this is just hitting a new um, age and a new demographic that can then get interested in it and talk about, you know, what is in space and what is in our airspace and, you know, what, what these different sightings could mean to different people. So, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. I don't think you can. Um, but at the same time, yeah, we have a certain um, responsibility with, you know, talking about this subject matter. And I'm wondering now, because you are kind of undecided on the show of of what to believe and, and what you do. And in the process of doing this without giving away anything that uh, you can't, uh, what so far has been what you feel is the most compelling piece of evidence you've seen to kind of make you think, wow, something is going on? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a culmination of things. I I'll say that, you know, we have an episode coming up in Brazil and we're down in Virginia, um, in this crash site that people, you know, call the, the quote unquote Roswell of Brazil and speaking with people down there, the way that they emote about these sightings that they had, um, it, it was it was really so captivating. I mean, there were times when, you know, I forgot that we were in the middle of the jungle talking to these people, you know, because you know something happened to them. And and that was really that was really interesting to me. Speaking with Travis Walton, that was the first time that I had some one on one time with him. And I think if you have any time with him, you'll understand that something beyond a natural occurrence happened with him. And when we were down in Texas, you know, at the Stephenville sightings and speaking to people at that town hall meeting and then going out and actually capturing footage of my own i think it's all rounded you know my uh, opinion you know slowly but surely making me think that there is something more going on here and um it's been an incredible opportunity. I'll say that I'm very open-minded. I want to believe, um, you know, and sitting with Ben on one side of me, like they're like my uh, my angel and my devil. They're my, my believer, my, my, my skeptic. But sitting with them, they both have such brilliant points that it's hard not to to move too, way, too far one way or another until we get some real physical evidence. So um, I think... The eyewitness testimony was unbelievable, and I think that that's difficult for some people at home to realize um, how convincing it can be without a photograph or without video, you know, proof. But at the same time, these are people with incredible stories, and I was thrilled to meet them. Um, and and that that was some of the most compelling evidence that I saw. I think the show has a has a great dynamic with this trio of researchers, you know, a, a skeptic, a believer, and an undecided. That that's a really good way to approach looking for evidence and, and approaching these different cases. But uh, you, you know, coming into this as an undecided, but with your background uh, from Destination Truth, I mean, you've seen some really bizarre things in your travels. So to me, I would think you would be more likely to believe. <laughs> I'm I've, I've seen some very bizarre things. I I've been blessed um, to say that I don't go to work. I go to play every day. Destination Truth was truly an incredible uh, experience and opportunity. And yeah, in fact, this season we're airing season five right now. And we go to Kazakhstan and we research some unexplained sightings uh, in that area. And, and that was one of the first big sightings I've ever had. So I can't talk too much about it, but I will say that that 
se severely changed my point of view in terms of what I think is going on, you know, above us and beyond. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, Ben's kind of taught me and my family taught me that you can't go into, you know, these cases with these really strong preconceived notions because that's going to taint, you know, the way that you see uh, these people talking and you're going to negate certain details. So I really try to stay in the middle. Um, I think with Destination Truth, we've seen some strange and unusual um, and in, in fact, you know, there's some stuff in Indonesia that I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably convinced that there's, you know, these these animals out there that people have not found evidence of kind of like their Bigfoot. Um, so I do know that there's something more to the mystery than, you know, just these fables or stories that are passed down from generation to generation. But at the same time, I kind of want to ride the line until something pushes me so far over to the edge that I'm I'm, I'm just, I can't think any other way, but you know, that, that there's something more there. Well, let's talk about the new episode of Chasing UFOs. This is the episode where you guys came to our state of Arizona and we actually got to hang out with you for a little bit. That was really cool. Um, well, we were super excited to go to Open Minds. I think obviously um, people that are tuning into this have seen your incredible work that you guys do, but I hadn't been aware of the extent to which it was. So we did this really incredible tour. Um, you know, we talked to Jeff Willis, who has got, uh, you know, actually captured some really incredible video evidence that he shares with us. We go on an investigation with you guys and Alejandro and Jeff and, you know, have some revelations of our own, which are brilliant and interesting. And then we go see Travis Walton and we go out to the actual abduction site and we look into some new um, observation, observations that he's made and we do some investigations that he's actually directed us to. He believes that there's new evidence of growth in the area in the particular you know abduction zone that hasn't affected the other areas so what we're doing is we're going there to see if there's any proof to say that you know something more happened here and could it be you know otherworldly was radiation involved was um or was it just a fluke in you know natural occurrence and you know there was just more rain in that area but i think it's a really great episode uh it's one of my favorites uh, not just because you guys are involved. Before then, I think Arizona has obviously been an incredible hotspot, and I had not been yet. So for me to go there, speak to these people, you know, and go out on these investigations myself, I think it's it, it was it was a real eye opener. Speaking about uh, Nat Geo, is there any indication yet? Uh, you know how they think uh, chasing UFOs is going, and is there any hint of a season two? You know, they're thrilled with how it's going. I think, um, you know, obviously television is rated by the numbers that we bring in and we've had a really strong viewership. We've been consistent with uh, bringing the audience to the channel. But I think that they want to see how the rest of the season does, as do we. So they're going to make a really big overall decision based upon all eight episodes once they mm -hmm. air. And uh, we're excited and, and we hope we hope that they love it as much as we do. And I know Ben, James, and I put a lot of hard work into it. And, um, you know, it may not be exactly, you know, what we started out shooting, but at the same time, in the end, we're really happy with the product and we think it can only get better from here. Excellent. That's awesome. Well, I can't wait to talk to you after the finale so I can find <laughs> out if your mind has been changed. <laughs> we'll definitely have to have you back on. But Ryder, thanks so much yeah, for taking the you. time to talk with us today and good luck with the show. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kate. So today, a movie called The Watch comes out, and Jason and I went to an advanced screening earlier this week. The movie stars Jonah Hill, Ben Stiller, and Vince Vaughn, and is about a group, a neighborhood watch group, that is uh, pretty much fighting alien invasion. Uh, it... <laughs> I, I'm going to say it right off the bat, it's incredibly crass, so for those of you who don't really have that sort of sense of humor, I would say skip it, but it's, we kind of do, so it was reasonably funny, pretty cheesy. Definitely. I mean, anybody who has seen any of the previous works by any of these actors, by Ben Stiller, Vince Vaughn, or Jonah Hill, should know exactly what you're getting yourselves into going to a movie that stars them, but I will give it to you straight right here. This sums it up. If you like sex jokes, poop jokes, or and or science fiction movies, then you're in luck. This movie's your dream come true because it takes all of those elements, puts them in a blender, and you get the watch. If you want serious sci-fi intelligence, though, 
Not the case. <laughs> There's no intelligence in this movie, and that What's could be it? a good thing. You know, it's good mindless comedy. Definitely seems like they took a page directly out of Stephen Hawking's book with this premise that extraterrestrials visiting Earth would be hostile and they wouldn't care about us. They'd push us to the side and take all of our resources and move Mostly on. hostile. So, yeah, absolutely. So if that's the kind of movie you're looking for, then the watch is for you. But if not... Uh, and in theaters tonight. That's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. And join us again next week when we'll talk with our guest Frank Kimbler, a guy who found mysterious metals near the crash site of the alleged Roswell UFO. Thanks for joining us. Remember to like this episode on YouTube and leave us your comments. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.